In this video, we discuss the epsilon delta definition of a limit. Now recall that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l um, just basically means that as x gets arbitrarily close to c, then the y values on the graph get arbitrarily close to l. So if the function happened to be continuous at x equals c and y equals l, the graph might look like this. And we're saying as we approach c from the left and the right, the y values get arbitrarily close to L. Now you might ask yourself, well, how do we make that idea rigorous? How do we um, make this idea of being arbitrarily close to uh, y equals L um, and this idea of being arbitrarily close to x equals c, how do we make that rigorous? Well, we can do so with the epsilon delta definition. Um, so this means that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So let's look at each of these pieces separately. Um, the absolute value of f of x minus l being less than epsilon means that f of x minus l is between negative epsilon and epsilon. And we know that because we understand absolute value inequalities. So let's review. If we just have the absolute value of x is less than 5. We're asking ourselves, well, um, what x values have a distance from 0 that's less than 5? Well, all the numbers between 0 and 5 are less than 5 units from 0. But all the numbers between negative 5 and 0 are also less than 5 units from 0. So all of the x values in here um, satisfy that inequality. So we could say that x is, just has to be between negative 5 and 5. So this absolute value inequality tells us that x is between negative 5 and 5. In the same way, if I've got this absolute value as less than epsilon, that means that f of x minus l has to be between negative epsilon and epsilon. So if we add three, or excuse me, add l to all three parts, we have that f of x is between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. Or in other words, if I add epsilon units to L and I draw a line y uh, with equation Y equals L plus epsilon, and I subtract epsilon units from L, and I draw a line at Y equals L minus epsilon, um, our Y values on the graph lie in between those two horizontal lines. Similarly, if I look at this inequality, there are actually two parts that I need to examine here. The compound inequality, I wanted to look at that one and then I'll look at the other one separately. So this first part, zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, you might think is obvious. You'd say the absolute value is always greater than zero. You say, well, no, it's not always greater than zero. There is one value when the absolute value is equal to zero. If x were equal to c, well, then this wouldn't be positive anymore. We'd have 0 is less than 0, which isn't true. So if we're saying that this absolute value is strictly positive, so strictly greater than 0, we're implying that x is not equal to c. So this is saying that x is not equal to c. Now, this part can be interpreted in the same way that that part can be interpreted. So we have... This absolute value is less than delta, which means that the expression inside the absolute value bars has to be between negative delta and delta. We'll add C to all three parts. So X is between C minus delta and C plus delta. So this inequality means this, and this compound inequality means that X is in this interval and X is not equal to C. So this original statement can be reinterpreted. It says, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if this is true, then this is true. We can represent that symbolically. For every can be represented by this upside down A. So we have for every epsilon greater than zero. There exists a delta greater than zero. So you could use a backwards E. For there exists, there exists delta greater than zero, such that we abbreviate with an st. If this is true, then this is true. That just means this 
inequality implies this inequality. Well, this inequality means that x is in this interval and x is not equal to c. And then this inequality means that. So we're saying for every epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small epsilon is, there is a delta greater than zero such that if x is within delta units of c, then the y values are within epsilon units of L. So there's that this saying that the y values are within epsilon units of L just means that the y's are between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. So we can go epsilon units above or epsilon units below, and we're fine with that, as long as x is within delta units of c. So here, we might draw a couple of vertical lines and say we want x, all of our x values in here, to map to the y values in there. And say, okay, well, what do those, um, and then we'll, we'll think of this, these two um, intervals as having length of delta one and delta two. You'd say, okay, um, if I want all of the x values in here to map to y values in here, I just need to take the minimum of those two deltas because in the minimum of those two deltas, all of the y values on the graph are gonna lie in between those two lines. And um, so this is a vertical line, x equals c minus delta one. And this is a vertical line with equation x equals c plus uh, delta two, and then we'll take the minimum of those, and then, or the minimum of those two deltas, and then add and subtract that from C to get the two vertical lines. So all of the X values in here map to Y values in that interval. Now let's look at this um, on Desmos.com for a particular example. And here's our particular example. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x. Now, the square root of x is a continuous function. Meaning we can draw the whole function without picking up our pencil. And that function is continuous, so the limit is actually equal to the function value. So the square root of four is two. So that the limit is the limit as x approaches four of the square root of x is equal to two. So in this case, our L is equal to two, our C is equal to four, and our function is equal to the square root of x. So we're going to explore this epsilon delta definition. Uh, using a graphing calculator online. All right, so the f of x is the square root of x. And we want to show that the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x is equal to 2. Now I'm using, in order to illustrate this graphically, I have, I have sketched some lines. Um, I sketched a dotted line for x equals uh, 4. Um, so we're letting x equals c, and we're setting c equal to 4, and that's that right there. And then we're letting y equal l, that's the horizontal line, where y is equal to 2, that's the value of our limit. And so I've got that horizontal line right there. Now, um, Desmos does not have uh, the ability to, uh, or does not allow us, excuse me, to uh, type Greek letters at this time. So we're going to set epsilon equal to A, and we're going to let delta 1 be equal to B1 and delta 2 be equal to B2. Um, A is our epsilon, so that's what we're adding and subtracting from Y equals um, L. Um, and we're adding or subtracting 1 in this case. So if Y is, or if L is equal to 2, we add 1 to that, we get 3. And if we subtract from 1 from that, we get 1. So we're looking at all the Y values between y equals 1 and 3, and we notice that if our x values are between 1 and 9, all of the x values between 1 and 9 give us y values between 1 and 3. So we know that 
Now, in general, we want to be able to find um, those um, x values or those delta values. Um, if I have, let's say, um, all of the x values between um, 1 and 9 mapping to y values between 1 and 3, the, I've got two options for delta. The first delta would be the distance between x equals 1 and x equals 4, which is 3. And the second delta would be the distance between x equals 4 and x equals 9, which is 5. Well, we want to take the minimum of those two values so that all of the x values in our interval map to y values in this interval. Since the minimum of 3 and 5 is 3, we'll take um, delta to be that first delta uh, of 3. And notice that if we're within 3 units of x equals 4, the y values map over here. Now, if I had drawn this a little bit differently, if I used the second value of B, Notice that we're going to have some x values outside of the interval from, say, negative 2 or negative 1 to 1 that map to y values that aren't in the interval from 0 to 3. See how my, if I, I guess I'd have to zoom out a little bit. See these, these x values over here don't give us y values between the two horizontal lines, so we don't want to use that. We need the minimum of those two y values for those two delta values. If we use the minimum, all of the x values in here map to y values. Now the epsilon delta definition says that for every epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, as long as we choose um, the right delta, all of the x values within delta units of x equals c will map to y values within um, epsilon units of L. And I chose initially epsilon equals 1. You might say, well, what if I chose a different value for epsilon? So if I chose epsilon to be larger, so epsilon in this case is 2.8, well, then my delta value could be larger. But the, the key is that epsilon can be as small as we want. So we started with epsilon equals uh, 1, but we could let epsilon equal 0.5, and then the corresponding delta would be strong, uh, smaller. And then we could let epsilon equal 0.28, uh, and then the corresponding delta would be smaller. And as, delta, as epsilon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the uh, delta value gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're zooming in on that point. Now, we're really not concerned about what happens at x equals 4, not when we are computing a limit. Um, our goal is just to sh show that for any epsilon we choose, there's always a delta so that all of the x values in here map to y values in there. Now, if you're saying to yourself, how did you figure out what those deltas were? How did you figure out what delta sub 1 and delta sub 2 would be in terms of epsilon? Um, we can do that on our paper. So let's look at that. But to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm going to graph my function from, from x equals 0 to x equals 9. So x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If you want, you can go all the way up to 10. And I'm graphing y equals the square root of x. So then x equals 0, the square root of x, or square root of 0 is 0, square root of 1 is 1, square root of 4 is 2, and square root of 9 is 3. So we've got a graph that looks roughly like that. And we're interested in this particular point. So our limiting value is 2 as x approaches 2 or excuse me, as x approaches 4. Um, uh, y equals the square root of x approaches the square root of 4, which is 2. 
And we want to be within epsilon units of two. So let's let epsilon equal 0.5. And we'll go from L or the, we'll look for all of the X values that give us Y values between two minus epsilon and two plus epsilon. If epsilon was 0.5, we'd be going from 1.5 to 2.5. To find the corresponding uh, deltas, I'm going to draw some vertical lines where those two horizontal lines cross my axis. This is x equals c here, set of uh, four. And the equation of this line is x equals c minus delta one. So in our case, four minus delta one. And over here, I have x equals c plus delta two, where this distance from there to there is delta two. Okay, now if we wanna find delta one and delta two, we're just gonna solve this equation. We've got y equals the square root of x, and I wanna know uh, what values uh, delta, or what is the relationship between delta and epsilon that would that would allow this x value to map to that y value? So when x is equal to c minus delta one, I might want my y values to be equal to l minus epsilon. In this case, our l is equal to two, and our c is equal to four. So I just replace x with four minus delta one, and then I replace the y with two minus epsilon, and then I solve for delta one. To get rid of this square root, we'll square both sides. If you want, you can write this twice in FOIL. First times first is four, outer times outer is negative two epsilon, inner times inner is negative two epsilon, so we get negative four epsilon. Last times last is epsilon squared. And I want to get delta one by itself. So I'll subtract four from both sides. That means those reduce. And then multiply by negative one. So we'll have delta sub one is equal to four epsilon minus epsilon squared. And we'll do something similar for this one. We've got y equals the square root of x. We're interested in y equaling two plus epsilon. When x is equal to c uh, plus delta 2, or in our case, c is 4, so we'll have 4 plus delta 2. And we'll solve that for delta sub 2. So we'll square both sides. If you want, you can write this twice in FOIL. The square root of something squared is just whatever was under the radical, provided that expression is positive. Then if we multiply that out, we have or, or two times two is four. Okay. Have two epsilon plus two epsilon is four epsilon. And then we've got an epsilon squared. Then we've got four plus delta two on the right. And then we subtract the fours from both sides and we have delta sub two is uh, four epsilon plus epsilon squared. Now we want delta to be the minimum of those two intervals, or excuse me, the minimum of those two uh, well, lengths. Um, and the minimum of four minus or four epsilon minus epsilon squared and four epsilon plus epsilon squared is this one. Because we, in both cases, we took four epsilon and we subtracted and added epsilon squared. So this one's smaller. We're gonna choose delta to equal the minimum. Or let's say choose delta to be less than the minimum of delta one and delta two. And the minimum is this one, because we're subtracting something positive to run, as opposed to adding it. So that's how I come up with the formulas that we're using on decimals. That's that four epsilon minus epsilon squared and four epsilon plus epsilon squared. 
we're just using A instead of epsilon and B1 and B2 instead of deltas of 1 and deltas of 2 because Desmos doesn't allow us to, or doesn't have the option to type the Greek letters at this time. All right, now you might actually be asked to use an epsilon delta proof to prove that that limit has that value. We want to show that the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x is equal to the square root of 4, which is 2. We kind of know it. We know that that's the answer because we know the function's continuous, and we can see it from the graph. But we might want to prove it using the epsilon delta definition. So let's say that that's what the problem statement says. OK, so we want to show that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, in this case, c is four, and that's less than delta. If that's true, then the absolute value of f of x minus l, in this case, the square root of x minus l, which is two, is less than epsilon. So we want to show them. Now, since that's our goal, when we write the proof, we're saying this is true for every epsilon greater than zero. So we want to just choose an arbitrary epsilon to be greater than zero. Um, but we can't just prove it for one epsilon. We have to choose it for all possible epsilons. So we want to write our proof in terms of epsilon in general. So we're just going to let epsilon be greater than zero. We're saying, just let it be some positive number. Any positive number is fine. And then we're going to try to choose a, an appropriate delta. And that delta is going to be a function of epsilon. We're going to say, if um, we've got some arbitrary positive epsilon, as long as we choose delta to be this function of epsilon, then this expression will imply, or this uh, compound inequality will imply um, that inequality, we just have to figure out what delta has to be in order to make that happen. So uh, let's look at this part. We're saying we want to show that this implies this, so we can assume that this is true. We want to assume that zero is less than the absolute value of x minus four, which is less than delta, which is the same as saying that x is not equal to four, because we're not concerned about what happens at equal, x equals 4 or x equals c whenever we're computing a limit. And at the same time, um, our x minus 4 is between negative delta and delta. Or equivalently, adding 4 to all three parts here, x is between negative delta. Uh, plus four and positive delta plus four. Okay, we're assuming that that's true. We're saying assuming that that's true, let's show that this absolute value is less than epsilon. So I've got the absolute value of square root of x minus two. And I want to relate that absolute value of square root of x minus two to this absolute value the absolute value of x minus 4, um, which we know to be less than delta. Well, x minus 4 isn't a difference of squares. We could think of it as a difference of squares. We know that a squared minus b squared factors to a plus b times a minus b. So if I use x minus 4 here, well, I can see that the square root of x could be used as my a square root of x times the square root of x would be um, x. And then if b squared is 4, we could add and subtract 2. And that would be equal to this. Um, so our a is square root of x, and our b is equal to 2. If you're not sure, just check it. Uh, first times first, square root of x times square root of x. Square root of x squared, which is just x. Outer times outer and inner times inner are the same, but with opposite signs, so they cancel. And last times last is the 2 times the negative 2, which is um, negative 4, which is what we have here. Um, so this can be factored in this way. 
as I am trying to relate this expression to that one, I look at this and I see what's missing. Well, that, if it's multiplied by that in absolute value, I would get the x um, minus four. So I'm gonna multiply by that. But just multiplying by that would change the value of the expression. So I need to divide by that as well. Call this multiplying by a well-chosen one. Now our numerator is the absolute value of x minus four, and the denominator is the absolute value of the square root of x plus two. And you really don't even need the absolute value in the denominator because the square root of x plus two is always positive. So we know that that's true. So I want to relate this expression back to my delta, and then I want to come up with a relationship between delta and epsilon so that as long as this is true, this expression here is always going to be less than epsilon. Well, I know from this part right here, the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta. Now our, for our denominator, we're going to need to use this inequality. This denominator has a square root of x in it. It has a plus 2 in it. Since I know that this is true, I can take the square root of all three parts. Take the square root of every part. And that's true because um, the square root of x is an increasing function. You might be saying, how do I... Let's verify that. Well, here's the idea. If I've got one x value and another x value, if I look at the y values on the square root of x graph, we know that the square root of that x value is going to be less than the square root of that x value. So if we have this inequality, we can take the square root of all three parts and it's totally fine. Um, so I have this is true by assumption. Since this is true, then we have that's true. And then I add two to all three parts so that I've got the square root of x plus two in the middle. And I want to relate uh, the square root of x plus two to delta somehow. So I can compare the square root of x plus two to this or this, but notice that it's in the denominator. Since it's in the denominator, I'd like to write uh, one over this in the middle of my compound inequality. Now remember, if a fraction is, if a denominator is smaller and the numerators are the same, the a fraction is going to be larger. So if we've got a bunch of less thans this way, if we flip everything, we're going to have greater than signs. Provided that all of the numbers involved are positive, And these are all positive because this is a positive number plus two denominators. So this is less than delta, and this expression is less than this expression. So we can multiply those two together, that delta times that is going to be greater than this in general. And that's just our, our scratch work that sort of got us that inequality. Now our goal is to make this, I wrote an eight there, it's supposed to be a delta. I need that to be less than epsilon. Yeah. I've got the square root of x minus two is less than yeah. delta divided by this expression. Now, because this is always greater than or equal to zero, I know that this expression is always greater than delta over two, because again, a larger denominator means a smaller fraction. You're taking that number and dividing it into larger pieces, or excuse me, into more pieces. Um, so uh, this fraction is smaller than this fraction. So if delta is equal to two epsilon, I'll have two times epsilon divided by two, and the epsilons, or excuse me, the twos will cancel and have epsilon there. 
So let's let delta be two epsilon and look at our proof again. So we're saying let epsilon be any number that's greater than zero, choose delta to be twice epsilon. Then assume that the absolute value of x minus four is less than that, that delta and the absolute value of x minus four is greater than zero, which just means that we're not concerned about what happens at x equals four and we want x to be between a four minus delta and four plus delta. Then the absolute value of f of x minus l, which in this case is the square root of x minus two, is equal to this. Now, again, we were trying to compare this to that x minus absolute value of x minus four. So we said, hey, I noticed that I can take this and I can factor it in this way. And if I factor it in that way, um, well, then I've got a, a factor of that square root of x minus two, which is what we're interested in. So I say to myself, okay, I want that to be as an x minus four in the numerator. So I'll multiply by the square root of x plus two. That's legal as long as I also divide by the square root of x plus two. And I wanted an absolute value, so I put them in absolute value, just multiplying by a well-chosen one. Then I multiply the numerators together. I get that. Of course, multiplying by one in the denominator just leaves the denominator alone. And now I have this expression, which is equal to this expression because this is always positive. You don't need absolute value bars around it. So now we're saying, how does that compare to delta? And then how do I need to relate delta to epsilon to get my answer? Well, this numerator is less than delta. And we said that this denominator, uh, or one over that denominator, is less than uh, one over two plus the square root of x or four minus delta because of this. The second compound inequality can be rewritten this way. If we take the square root of all three parts, we can add two to all three parts, and then we can take reciprocal as long as we flip these. Um, and so that one over this uh, factor, or one over this factor there is strictly less than this. So if this expression is less than delta and one over this expression is less than that, then the product of those or the quotient, uh, if we write it this way, has to be less than this. We say, I want that to be less than epsilon. Well, that expression is guaranteed to be less than delta, delta over two. As long as delta is two epsilon, the twos will cancel and we'll have that expression being less than epsilon. So that'll work. And I think we've just proved that um, the limit as x approaches four of the square root of x is equal to two using the epsilon delta definition. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, why can't I just choose the minimum of those two? And say, well, choose the delta to be the minimum of those two and we're good to go. And um, you're right. And that's actually gonna be um, the largest delta uh, that will map to that interval. Let's look at um, desmos.com again. But that delta of four uh, epsilon minus epsilon squared is the largest epsilon or excuse me, the largest delta that will give us um, well, all of the x values within delta units of x equals four mapping to all the y values between within epsilon units of uh, y equals L. Um, but we can take any smaller epsilon as well, um, and or any smaller uh, delta as well, and it turns out that two delta will work And I added a little bit of a code here. I said I wanted to look at the interval from x equals uh, four minus two epsilon to x equals four plus two epsilon. Notice that that gives us a bunch of x values that map to appropriate y values. But notice that if we had used that uh, delta sub one, all of those x values also map to that interval. That's the larger interval. Um, and this actually works for all values of A. So if I let A increase, notice that this sort of white shaded region is always smaller than the orange shaded region. And let me get rid of that right for just for a moment. Notice also that if we had used the larger delta, there are X values over here on this interval um, from C uh, plus delta sub one 
to C uh, plus delta sub two, where those X or those X values map to Y values in the interval that we're interested in. But if we made it symmetric, there would be Y values over here that wouldn't map to that interval. Um, so that's why we need to choose the smaller of the two deltas. Um, but that's actually the smaller of those two deltas, the four plus or four epsilon minus epsilon squared and the four epsilon plus epsilon squared. That's like the largest possible delta that will give us um, Y values in the interval that we're interested in. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, we can use the uh, two F, uh, delta equals two epsilon as well, and that, that'll still work. Uh, it'll still allow us to prove what we're trying to prove, which is that for any epsilon greater than zero, I can always choose a delta so that all the um, X values within delta units of zero are, excuse me, delta units of C are within epsilon units of L. If you're not sure, you can always change your epsilon. And you can see that the interval of width two epsilon gets smaller and smaller, just as the interval uh, within uh, delta units uh, maps to the same interval as well.